Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast entitled ARL's Envisioning Research Library Features, ARL Scenario Thinking Project. If you have questions during today's presentation, you may ask your questions by utilizing the Ask a Question box located at the bottom of your window. Questions will be answered at the conclusion of today's session. If you experience any technical problems or need assistance throughout the presentation, please contact customer support at 888-567-1603. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Carla Streeve. Carla, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, I'm Carla Streeve, Assistant Executive Director at the Association of Research Libraries. I'm responsible for ARL's program on transforming research libraries. Today's webcast is organized by the Association of Research Libraries, whose 125 members include many of the largest libraries in the U.S. and Canada. Thank you for joining us today as we introduce the concept of scenario planning. We will also be describing ARL's project to develop new tools to help research libraries expand their understanding of the challenges and opportunities the future might present to us. We will be presenting for about 40 minutes today and then we will have time for questions and answers. I want to say just a few things and then turn the mic over to our presenter, ARL's project consultant, Susan Stickley. ARL's Transforming Research Libraries program launched the Scenarios Planning Project to provide member libraries with tools that they can use to strengthen their own planning for the future of their libraries. Those tools will consist of a set of four scenarios and a toolkit to help libraries use the scenarios for their own planning. I want to emphasize that the deliverables of the project are being created for librarians to use at their institutions. The project work got started back in February, and there's growing interest in it, which is why we're talking with you today. A lot of the interest is based in the fact that scenario planning is quite different from the more common forecasting and environmental scanning we usually do in conjunction with library planning. So we will be spending some time talking today about what kinds of challenges scenario planning was developed to address and how it works. We want to understand how scenario planning is different, but also how it can synergize with other more familiar approaches to planning. Another goal is to help folks understand how the process we're using will lead to the deliverables of a scenario set and toolkit for research libraries, and how we're engaging the community in the development of those tools. I'm now going to turn the conversation over to Susan Stickley of Stratus, Inc. Susan is an expert on scenario planning and has worked with a variety of organizations over many years on developing and using scenario planning tools. She's working with ARL to design and implement the scenario set and the toolkit we'll be releasing as the main project deliverables this fall. Susan? Thank you, Carla. I'm pleased to be with you all today, and I'm going to take us through um, some slides and a presentation to help introduce you to the scenario thinking methodology and, in a, in a sense, why it is a, a valuable tool to use and how it is used. And along those lines, then, um, we will then, toward the back end of the presentation, focus in on ARL's actual use of this tool for the members. Um, so I'm pleased to be here, and we're going to dive right in. And I'm going to start with a um, great quote from Edward de Bono, which talks about what we refer to as the business of possibility. Um, and it goes, there is this totally absurd notion that knowledge proceeds in neat steps from known facts through logical deduction. And I, I love this particular quote because it really gets at the essence as to why scenario thinking has been um, employed and used by so many organizations and, and why it is a useful tool to use. Um, we do tend to spend a lot of time as human beings um, in what I would call the known environment or that area of certainty or creative in our thinking. And um, how that happens and why it happens is based on something that we refer to as uh, the illusion, if you will, of certainty um, that we exist in. And here are um, a whole series of quotes. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I think you'll find them interesting to um, read through. I'm going to focus on a few. But they're all um, from people that we would consider back in history looking at and saying, you know, here are, you know, visionary thinkers, experts in particular areas, people who in many ways, if you will, defined what the future became, and yet they, like us, 
um, live within an illusion of certainty at certain points. That's really based on the assumptions that we all hold. Um, the first quote here um, from Thomas Edison is a very old but a classic one. Um, after he had invented the phonograph where he said he sees no commercial value in it because he could not imagine this tool being used um, in the ways that, of course, it, it became applied later on. Um, after that one, we look down. I'm going to go down a couple more quotes down to Ken Olson. If you look at the third one, there's no reason for an individual to have a computer in their home. And, you know, Ken Olson was brought up in the computer industry, but during the era of the mainframe and the supercomputer. And so the concept of an individual computer, and now the concept we're at, which is, you know, really, I'll say even a personalized uh, computing device, was well beyond where Ken could imagine things going back in 1970. And it's followed up by a, um, not really a quote, but a, a piece of information that comes from a strategy uh, project that was actually done at IBM back in the late 70s. Um, and some colleagues of mine who had been involved with this made note of this because, it, you know, over time as things change, because it was interesting to, to take this into account. And I know many of you probably have dealt with this own challenge in your own organizations where um, a, a project was created to try to understand what the personal computer was going to be. It was just coming out at this time. And a team went off to do this, and they came in front of their executive team with a uh, slide that laid out all their thinking and a forecast on what they really felt the sales could be of PCs for the decade of the 1980s. And it, it totaled up to 295,000 units. And at this time, this was considered an enormous number because this was the time of the supercomputer and there were only so many, you know, a, a select number, if you will, even in existence at this point. And you can just imagine trying to be the individual in the room who raised their hand at that point and said, you know what, I think that number's a little low. I think it's going to be more like 25 million. And they, of course, have been thrown out on their head and the executives would have said, what are you thinking about? So I just want to suggest to you that this sense of thinking, um, the sense of certainty that we exist in is forced upon us in many ways, and we have to come up with ways to, to work around it. Um, the last quote is just a fun one, um, fun for us, not for General Sedgwick, um, who um, in battle mentioned to his first officer they couldn't hit an elephant at that disc and never finish the statement. Um, he missed the invention of the rifle, um, and unfortunately that was his last statement. Um, and so, so we move on and we talk more about, well, let's think about things closer to today um, that have happened in our past. And, in fact, this is a, a slide that the bullets on it um, start kind of earlier and then come up to closer to present day. We end up with the last bullet in 2008 dealing with the global financial crisis that we're all still going under. And the header here is, of course, who would have guessed and the answer to that is, well, if, if you actually use the scenario tool, you would have an opportunity to consider every one of these opportunities. And, in fact, all of these things were picked up in various scenario exercises that have been done over the years. The question is, would you have acted on it or been able to figure out what to do about it? Um, and that's where very often we fall short. The problem with looking out into the future whether, when there's so much uncertainty and in the area of research libraries um, and higher education, clearly that's the case, it is really hard not to suffer from paralysis um, and simply keep doing what you've been doing because to change it feels extremely risky. And in that sense, that's where scenario thinking becomes helpful. Um, in fact, in, in talking about strategy, there's really three elements to it. There's who we are, who we want to be, and where we have to work. And the scenario piece falls into where we have to work, and that's where the ARL um, toolkit, if you will, uh, resides. Um, and that particular um, toolkit, of course, includes scenarios themselves, but also direction on how do you apply these in your organization. And what I want to suggest to everyone on this call, so whatever organization you're in um, as, as a member organization, what you would be doing in-house is actually going through a discussion of all three of these elements. And the toolkit will kind of help you through that process. But, you know, who we are and who we want to be are things that organizations tend to have a better handle on than they do about understanding the environment around them. And the result of not having that understanding is is a reactive process in your in your marketplace. And so uh, Henry uh, Mintzberg a number of years ago talked about the concept of emergent. 
strategy. And in emergent strategy, what he was referring to is, you know, organizations have intended strategies, but they never achieve them because of environmental forces that impact them. Um, that they don't see coming. And because of those environmental forces, uh, the emergent strategy happens, and that's what the organization follows. Um, and in his description, it's a very reactive sort of process that organizations go through. And what I want to suggest to you is um, scenarios are supposed to provide you context for the environment around you, that the forces around you, so that your intended strategy um, is possible, but it takes into account those forces. So it might not have been the, I'll say, the um, intended strategy you might have had before you were informed by the, the scenario activity, but it would be an intended strategy you would develop because of the scenario activity. So why scenarios? Um, they focus on uncertainty, the things that we don't know about. Um, they value and share diverse views. They explore complex dynamics of change, not singular um, variables of change, but complex dynamics of change. They anticipate the business environment change faster, and they enable successful adaptation to change through contingent plans and strategies. And that's a real mouthful. Um, but what I'm getting at there is, um, and, and I will go into more detail on this as we get into the presentation, um, contingent plans really refers to that after you have created a set of scenarios, you utilize them by literally, if you will, almost running your organization through them, um, running your strategic thinking through the scenarios to figure out what you do to succeed in every scenario. By going through that process, you create what are considered contingent strategies that are contingent upon each of the scenarios that you develop. Um, would I say you immediately go out and act on all of them? Absolutely not. Um, there is a pretty disciplined process, which will, of course, be part of the toolkit, um, to determine what of those things that you learn through that scenario um, exploration you do apply into your current strategic thinking and your strategy, and what are those plans that remain contingent that you almost, if you will, hold them in your back pocket such that as things play out and emerge in the marketplace, you are then prepared to act. Um, so these are the various reasons why scenarios. And I'm going to take us through a few slides to really just talk about scenarios themselves and what I mean by that, because one of the things that's a bit tricky is um, there are a lot of things being done today that people refer to as scenario planning, um, scenarios, and so forth, and very often they're very different types of things. So I just want to make sure before we get off of this uh, webcast today that for this audience we're clear on what ARL is referring to as scenarios and, and what we're using in that, mind, that, that mindset. So. Taking a look at this um, map, which is a great 16th century map of North America, and I'm sure you've all noted that you can make out North America, but there's also some interesting quirks on this um, map. Um, at least we would look at them as quirks today. Uh, and a couple things that you can learn from looking at this map that um, are very helpful um, toward a metaphor that I'd like you to have in the back of your mind, and that metaphor is the concept of mental maps. Uh, Peter Senge coined that term a number of years ago, and in fact, we believe that the reason scenario planning can be very helpful in an organization is it helps us challenge our mental maps about our marketplace. So with the concept of mental map in mind, how does a map come to be? Um, and looking at this map, you'll note the coastal regions are a bit larger um, than the internal areas. The detail is stronger on the external areas. All of that's the result of, of course, how the map came to be, which was the result of um, explorers traveling around this new world and logging in what they saw. Um, and, and made note of in, in their log books and getting that back, to, in this case, to Europe, to the map makers, who then created maps from that data. Now, you might wonder, how did the explorers travel down the Gulf of California? And, in fact, we know they didn't because it didn't exist. However, what they did do is they traveled around the north, which is the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and around the Baja Peninsula, and in both cases made note in log books about non-navigable water. And here's a classic example of 
uh, the challenge of the illusion of certainty, right? So we have uh, map makers who've never traveled to this land being given data, two data points, and what I would consider a very big unknown um, in retrospect. However, what they did was they took that information and, in a sense, created a line between those two points and made it quite non-navigable, and hence the Gulf of California came to be, um, so that they continued that waterway through. Um, why this is useful to us is um, to think through the process of, of how such a thing can happen. Um, it's also useful to think about um, from the, the concept of um, what, what it means to us and how we think about things around us and things we know about and things we don't know about. So here in this particular case, um, you, you have to take into account that sometimes when you don't know something, um, you will fill in the um, area. And actually, if you look at the way your organization probably does strategy, if you have not used a tool similar to, to scenarios, um, it's mo most possible that what you've done is created a strategy based on what you know, not what you don't know about, which clearly makes sense to all of us. Um, the, the, the challenge here is what do we do about that? What do we do to, if you will, either correct or at least take into account these potential errors that might exist in our mental maps? And so from a scenario planning standpoint, what would have occurred in this particular case in the 16th century would have been the creation of more than one map. Um, with, and this is just focusing really on the Gulf of California, but with the Gulf of California, if, if you were the map maker and you were given these two data points and took into account what we in, in scenario uh, methodology refer to as a critical uncertainty, i.e. the unknown between those two points, you would have created two maps. One would have been a land mass and one would have been an island. And with both maps in hand, then those who were to use these maps later on would have been better prepared um, for what um, they account encountered. And in fact, the history of this particular type of map um, goes to speak to um, the missionaries and others that followed um, who actually, with this wrong map in hand, obviously came across many problems when they didn't discover the Gulf of California that they expected to discover, including things like carrying longboats over the Sierra Nevada that they felt they were going to need. Um, and all of this data was collecting, really supporting this being a wrong map, but it actually took seven decades for the map to be changed. Um, and this is very much the way it is in organizations with maps about the marketplace. It takes a long time for leadership often to make a change in their thinking because even though it's maybe based on something that's not known, um, it, it, it develops into a real set of strong beliefs. And so there lies the challenge for us is how do we go about holding more than one map in mind? How do we go about that? So I want to speak um, a moment then about um, this idea of taking into account things without over, overly simplifying them. Um, and on the left side on this particular chart, you see um, what's being referred to as forecast planning. And I want to first just say clearly, um, forecast planning is a very valuable tool. Uh, however, it has a very specific set of purposes. In forecast planning, that's, it is very powerful and useful when you're doing financial planning and, and necessary, frankly, that you can forecast out and be able to actually see um, that you're able to sustain your organization and so forth given budget and financial situations. However, when that same methodology is applied to what we refer to as real strategic planning for the organization, the future planning of the organization, it falls short because it's really based on the knowns and it's also based on one set of assumptions and those assumptions that are currently being acted on. Um, and so what we do in scenario planning is we say, well, let's just open that up a bit. Let's still take the knowns into account, the things that we absolutely do know about. However, let's also identify the uncertainties, the things we don't know about, and use those to create more than one um, view, if you will, of the future, and in fact allow us to look at multiple views. We call this multiplicity of thought, and it's really the essence of scenario planning. And along these lines, you never actually choose one of the futures as the one that you plan toward. You actually plan toward the entire set. 
and that's, again, all part of the process is how do you do that, and we will go into that in a little bit. But it's very important to make note of it. It's really a completely different process than what is morally, more considered, I'll say, the traditional um, mechanisms um, for, uh, scenario, or, or for uh, strategic thinking. Here we have a um, different way of also looking at scenarios versus um, a form of forecast, which is called sensitivity analysis. And I picked this purposely because sensitivity analysis tends to be the one very often that we use the language and the term scenarios in. And people will say, oh, yes, I've done scenario planning. We created a scenario around this issue and, and studied it, or we created a scenario around this issue and studied it. And it is different than what we refer to as scenario planning. And I just want to kind of go through this kind of quickly. Um, in scenarios, we do what we call outside-in thinking, which I'm going to introduce to you in just a moment, which really talks about looking broadly to the external environment first and then bringing it back into the organization. In sensitivity analysis, you generally start from the organization and work out toward you know, some, some change you want to apply to what you know currently about the organization. Uh, in scenarios, it's multiple possible futures that you're considering, and along those lines, as I mentioned earlier, it's also multiple sets of assumptions that you're considering. Whereas in sensitivity analysis, you're really basing this on more of a forecast, or I'll call it a single assumption set, a set of knowns, um, or that you're considering to be knowns. In scenarios, you actually highlight the uncertainties to stretch mental maps, whereas in sensitivity analysis, you're actually highlighting the certainties and supporting the current view. It's, it's a very kind of different switched process in that way. And in scenarios, it's really a qualitative process versus sensitivity analysis, which is the quantitative process, i.e. what I mentioned earlier, um, the concept of you know using this effectively for financial planning and sensitivity analysis is extremely valuable in that in that um, frame. Scenarios allow you to consider complex systems, whereas sensitivity analysis does really um, work through what we call the single variable focus, meaning um, each version of a sensitivity analysis generally takes a variable and changes it one variable at a time, which then allows you to begin to understand um, the level of sensitivity the different variables have to change. So I want to now go back to this outside in thinking um, with you and spend just a few moments talking about it. And so here we have a slide that on the left side has these um, three circles inside of each other, and I just want to suggest to you, um, imagine your organization and whatever your strategic focus or issue is in the center um, of those three circles. And around you, you are surrounded by the working environment or what might be more commonly referred to as the marketplace. Um, another term we use for it is the transactional space because it's the space in which you transact. It's the space for you where your users would be, the funders, the universities, um, and so forth and so on, including you know, um, faculty members, staff, um, publishers, on and on and on. So all of those things float around in what we call that transactional environment. Um, outside of the transactional space is the broader contextual environment. This is the, the environment of broad social, technological, economic, environmental, and political change. And the key in scenario thinking is that good scenarios actually have at their basis the starting point of their of the thought process or what we refer to as the logic begins in the contextual environment. It goes broader than the transactional space. And you might be surprised by that and go, well, geez, then don't you create scenarios that aren't useful? Um, and my answer would be no, not at all, because you're doing that with an understanding of strategically why you've chosen to look at the external environment. So what you're actually doing is creating almost a... Um, an eggshell, if you will, around you that allows you to paint a picture of change. And In fact, it's painting a series of pictures of change um, of how your world and environment will be dramatically different in the future. And it's a disciplined process to allow you to do it such that you're creating them so that you've really covered the possibilities that lie in front of your organization for a defined time frame that you've set. Um, in the case of ARL, we're actually looking out 20 years in the future. 
um, in creating the scenario set. You might go, my God, 20 years, how can you do that? Well, you can do it, and actually, in, in a sense, one part of it becomes easier because the things that are uncertain, there are so many of them, that you have a really strong basis and platform from which to then create the scenario set. But outside in thinking is key here, and this is the thing that I just want to really stress with people is, is the power of this tool um, and for your organizations, which is to allow you to see things that would be outside of your marketplace environment that you would, in a sense, almost be blind to, that you must and should be taking into account when you do your strategic thinking. So this is all about creating advantage for your organization from uncertainty, and I just now want to actually take us into the process itself, um, looking at this um, path that we've kind of laid out here for you. The process starts with an orienting process in which the strategic focus is identified um, for um, the project, and in this case for ARL, we have gone through that process. Um, and in a few moments, I'll, I'll share with you that strategic focus that we've been using. Um, it was developed by going out and doing interviews. We've done surveys. We've talked to quite a few people and gotten a lot of insight on what really is the strategic question here. What should research libraries be asking about the future? And that becomes that relevancy basis that we then can use to then go out to that broad contextual environment and say, so what are those changes out there that could, in fact, influence the answer to our question. So we have that strategic focus. Once we have that strategic focus, we then go into this exploring process where we think very broadly about what we call the critical dynamics, the uncertainties, and then also the certainties, otherwise known as predetermines, that are in the world. What, what is going on around us? What are those drivers of change? And from those, we then go through a process to actually select which um, uncertainties in particular are more relevant and important um, to be built out, if you will, and brought to life in the scenarios than others, and we create a framework for the scenarios, and then we actually go into writing the scenarios themselves. Um, this particular process for ARL has taken us through a um, two-day workshop that we held in June um, in which we actually went through brainstorming drivers of change, identifying critical uncertainties, um, working through many versions of what a framework could be for a set of scenarios, and then settling on the one that we felt was most effective um, for the ARL project. Um, that material is still in work um, and in process now, um, and we are now currently engaged in starting to actually write the scenarios as stories, narratives about um, the current time, 2010, out 20 years, and how each scenario comes to be and what those end states will be like. Um, after that process, that, that's kind of this process that we refer to here as synthesis and synthesizing, we then go into the area where you really begin to strategically act on the scenarios. And this is where um, the toolkit is going to be finalized around the scenarios, uh, offering um, templates to help guide organizations in how to apply the scenarios, suggesting you know, for various key stakeholders within your organizations and around your organizations what would be different ways you might choose to engage them and how to go through the process of um, applying the scenarios into your strategy. Um, and that process then continues further, um, and it's really a choice of each organization how far you want to take this. But in scenario planning, we don't really consider it an event. We consider it a new way of thinking in strategy so that there's an ongoing process of now that you have the scenarios and you've applied them to your strategy, looking out to the external environment and to your marketplace and beginning to become more aware of change as it's happening so that you can adapt over time to those things. What I would like to do now is we're going to actually focus in on um, this process in two segments. The first segment is the one that I'm working closely um, internally now with ARL with the members. We we're including them in all of this work um, and actually the content's being developed by them, but I'm kind of guiding it, um, which is really the first part of this process um, from that internal um, data gathering process to developing a strategic focus to creating the scenario set, that whole piece. I just want to suggest to you um, that that's a process that you don't do, if you will, every year in your organization. Even assuming you have a three- or five-year plan, most organizations refresh their plan each year 
And if that's the case, I just wanted to make it clear to everyone that you would not be starting from scratch recreating a set of scenarios each year. In fact, you would use the same set for as long as they are relevant and useful to your thinking. Um, and we can talk a bit later if anyone chooses about, you know, how you do that. But that, again, will be part of the toolkit. We'll, we'll have that included in there. Um, that first process is what leads us to a scenario set itself, and I'll say the first engagement of, you know, what we really uh, mean by the strategic insights and the robust ideas, the ideas that are powerful and work, work across the scenarios. And so I just want to share with you a sample from a completely different market and industry. In fact, this is the auto industry, but I just thought it would be useful so that um, you become aware of what I mean when I say a scenario set or I refer to something like a scenario framework. What, what am I talking about? So this is actually a real project. It was done a number of years ago um, through Global Business Network, um, who, who I do a lot of work with. But this was done with one of the big three auto organizations in the U.S. back in the 80s. Um, when they really were the big three at that point. Um, and uh, what I'm looking at here with you on the screen is what we would refer to as a scenario set that they created, and they had a strategic focus. Um, I don't actually have privy to what the actual strategic question was that they asked, but the result of it was this particular diagram that we refer to sometimes as a scenario matrix or as a scenario set. And what you see here is two axes, the vertical and the horizontal axis, which are framers of the set. And in fact, both of them are critical uncertainties. Um, but I want to note to you that do not confuse yourself and think that a scenario just has two uncertainties inside of it. In fact, each of the scenarios has probably somewhere between six to 12 different uncertainties carefully built out in the storyline. So they're much more complex than kind of a sensitivity sort of view. But these two axes were chosen because they were thought to be the best framers of the set of four scenarios. They allowed the scenarios to uh, be the most provocative and challenging for the client, and they allowed them to be the most divergent, meaning the most different from the day they were created, the time they were created, which again was in the 80s. And so what you have here is one axis that deals with fuel prices Price, the vertical, high to low, and the other deals with the types of values that consumers would be applying to the decision to purchase a vehicle. So on one side, you have neo-traditional values, and on the other, these interdirected values. And the result of those two axes are that you then, in each quadrant, so each section, if you will, between the axes, a scenario is created and developed. And so we have in the upper right quadrant the green highways where you have smaller cars and versatility being kind of the two really kind of key underlying premises that develop out of all of that complex logic. In the bottom right, um, it's the scenario of foreign competition where there are sportier cars and light trucks and vans and so forth coming forth. It's an innovative sort of world where you have interdirected values and low fuel prices. So people are doing interesting things, if you will, in, in the field. Then you go to the bottom left, and we have Long Live Detroit. This was the classic kind of muscle car view. Brand loyalty was here, all those types of things. Um, and finally, the upper left was called the Engineer's Challenge. Um, efficiency and protectionism were up there. You have high fuel prices and neo-traditional values, so people want more than they can probably get, and so the engineers are challenged to make those things happen. Um, and, and what's kind of interesting here is when you look at this set of scenarios is you might go, well, my God, in the 80s, how could they possibly believe long live Detroit? In fact, the result of this for this client was for them to discover that that particular scenario was a bit of what they would refer to as their official future. Um, it was what they were living toward, and after they started exploring the scenarios, they discovered more and more that the other three were much more plausible and, in fact, appeared to be where the future was going. But that was in the process of applying the scenarios longer term. Now, you also might look at these four and say, well, how did they create a strategy out of this? Because I can think of a strategy for every one of these quadrants, but I don't see one strategy that works across them. In fact, there is a process, and it will be the process that we'll be sharing with you through the toolkit, that allows you to start creating a strategy from those. And um, I just want to share with you this kind of simplified version of where they went with that set of four scenarios. They created a set of very important implications that applied to all of them. Um, engineering for efficiency 
was extremely important, and the concept of designing hybrid vehicles made sense. Um, you know, the car truck high top, the car van, actually the result of this scenario study was the concept of the minivan um, coming out and that sort of thing moving forward. Um, so just I, I wanted to show you this sample for two reasons. One is just to kind of allow you to see where we're going with this and what type of thing will be developed in the future um, from this work and what you'll be able to do with it. And secondly, to understand that, yes, you can create a set of strategic insights that you can apply in your organization from multiple scenarios without choosing a scenario to follow. And it's very important not to choose a scenario because the future will end up being made up of components of all of the set, um, components of that are covered, if you will, in this particular set from all four of those scenarios did in fact play out as time went on. The second part of this process, if you remember I said we'll first talk about that um, once done section that you do to create your scenarios and get those first insights, and then we're going to talk about the longer term process. This longer term process um, is where you begin to monitor the future. Um, and again, you know, we will share information with everyone in the toolkit, but this is an organizational choice. Um, some organizations don't choose to go down this path. It really depends how much you want to apply this. Um, so depending on how much you want to apply this inside of your organization, that's what will um, take you to choosing, you know, how, how much of this particular part of the process you want to do. But the bottom line is it allows you to become more adaptive, to learn from your environment, and to be able to do more effective work um, moving forward in your marketplace um, for your users um, and for your organization. So here we have a classic learning loop. Um, where we start in the top, you know, your organization has strategic choices um, and actions that guide your monitoring and reflection, which enables you to uncover relevant new information about the external environment and marketplace to inform new research inquiries and strategic plan adjustments, which then drive, of course, your strategic choices and action. So it's an ongoing process of adapting and staying proactive in your marketplace. That's really our goal. I'm going to take a few moments now and um, before going back to the ARL material itself, I just want to share with you a couple things about Royal Dutch Shell. I thought it would be useful to hear kind of a classic case of how an organization, probably more effectively than anyone, has applied um, this particular process in their organization. Now, Royal Dutch Shell has the benefit of being the organization that actually took the scenario tool, which earlier had been used by the military, and began applying it. Um, in a corporate setting. Um, so they had all of that benefit, and, and obviously they've had a lot of time. They've been doing, they actually started working with this in the late 70s, but started really effectively applying it in the early 80s. So let me take you just through a couple slides on this, because I think it's kind of interesting to see what's possible, um, and to also see what I refer to as the power of this as a risk mitigation tool. So by using scenarios, Shell discovered in the early 80s um, a very clear understanding of the cyclic nature of oil prices and supply demand. Um, and that might sound surprising and ridiculous that that wasn't clear, but earlier than that, it wasn't as, as clear as, as it was at that point for them in the industry that they could actually see that um, oil prices were going to go up and they were going to go down. They were even able to gain a feel for what the length of time was on those cycles. And at this point in the early 80s, um, they decided to do two things. One is uh, part of their insight was to really understand um, the nature of commodity and the nature of uh, oil being a commodity. They decided to develop and, and build on an opportunity that they saw through the scenario exercise, which was to create a trading organization. And Shell's trading organization to this day is one of the largest in the world around commodities. But um, they understood globally um, that, in fact, oil and other products would be traded and would be traded very, very actively depending on supply-demand um, dynamics. Um, during this time as well, they focused in on their R&D and they started to lower what we would call their kind of centralized cost basis and structure. By the mid-80s, which is 
actually in my background, I, I come out of the oil and, and chemical industry. That was about when I was entering the industry. Um, by the mid-'80s, they were doing something very unusual. And, in fact, um, those, you know, on Wall Street and, and around the globe and the global markets watching Shell couldn't quite understand or fathom what they were doing. But while the oil industry was, um, at this time, enjoying very high oil prices um, and making enormous profits on what they what they could do in the market, Shell started to hunker down and actually build a cash basis. And again, um, the financial markets could not understand this. Everyone they competed with was spending money. Um, this was the time um, in the industry where we had very clearly, um, you know, the the executive jets, the marble executive offices, and so forth and so on happening that you hear about um, in hindsight. And yet Shell was hunkering down and building up cash. And they were doing this purposely because they could understand that there was a cyclic nature. And the price was high, but it was going to drop, and it was going to drop substantially. And by 86, the price did drop. And when everyone else now was cash poor, they had a huge cash reserve. And they went out and bought oil reserves at very low prices. And, in fact, this is when they moved from number 14 up to what I think at that point was number three in the industry. They did it overnight, and it was a it was actual, you might go, oh, my God, that was such a risky thing to do. But for them it wasn't. They had used the scenario tool, and it was actually mitigating risk. If they had not done this, it would have been a riskier play because they understood the uncertainty around them. So I just want to suggest to you the power of that in their thinking. And so over the years, from the 70s forward, you know, they were doing more simplistic work in the 70s where they would have a specific strategic issue and would apply scenarios to it. They would create them around the issue and they'd answer the question. And when I say specific, it could be around um, specifically building a new plant in a particular location, that focused. Um, or, you know, as, as time went on, they started saying, well, we can apply this more broadly. And in the 80s, this period that I just showed you, um, they started doing doing corporate strategy using scenarios where they actually started saying we can actually drive the long-term strategic plan. And Shell was always a very large, complex company um, and had a lot of different arms and businesses that they were in. And this was a way to align their organization. Um, the ARL tool we're creating, in a sense, for you is to allow you to do corporate work. Um, and then you can choose in your organizations if you choose to focus it further um, in businesses. Um, in the 90s, they got involved with a wider range of applications. They started exploring different uses of the tool and using it for ideation and creativity and, and to build understanding within their organizations. And since the 90s into now, you know, this new millennium, they have gotten much more involved doing something really interesting. Number one, flexibly using it and applying all of these things that they've done before. But number two, they've begun to use scenarios to share more broadly in the external environment um, the concept of change with the public. So they've been very involved in looking at um, creating what are considered 50-year energy scenarios and so forth to start influencing, um, uh, you know, the World Economic Forum and various uh, governments and public agencies around the globe um, to the benefit of, you know, the future. So it's very interesting. You know, they've kind of taken it a very far path, but I just thought it would be interesting to share that with you. I'm going to just share a couple more slides, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. I want to show you a timeline. This is the timeline for the project itself here at ARL. Um, in the spring, we actually went through that strategic focus process, and I suggested to you that we have one that I'll show you in just a second. Um, I just want to invite you that on the website under this project, the uh, report on the internal uh, data gathering process, including a description of the strategic focus and the reasoning behind it are all there, and um, you would be welcome to see that at some point if you'd like. This, we, we have created the scenario framework, and this summer now we're writing the narratives. Um, in the fall of 2010, um, the scenario set in the toolkit as a whole will be released, and the timing we're looking for or looking at at this time would be the October membership meeting um, to do that. And... Let me just share with you the strategic focus that we used for this project. Um, it's color-coded purposely to just show you um, two things. One is the writing in black. How do we transform our organization or organizations to create differential value for future users? 
that include individuals, institutions, and beyond, that piece will be the focus question that you will be applying in your organization. The second part, given the external dynamics redefining the research environment over the next 20 years, is the portion of this question that helped us in framing the scenarios themselves that we are currently developing. So here's the question, and I just want to suggest to you all of the wording on here is very purposeful, and if you take a look at that report, you'll get a great understanding of the thinking behind it. And I want to end with two things. One is just going back to this elements of strategy slide to remind you that the scenarios themselves are not the end result of this project. The end result of this work, we hope, is that within your member organizations you have a full strategic conversation, um, including a discussion of who you are, who you want to be, and, and that the scenarios themselves are helpful to you in having that conversation. And I'm going to leave you with a wonderful quote from Ari de Hurst, who actually led uh, scenario planning at Royal Dutch Shell for a period, um, wrote a book called The Living Company, which was one of those books on kind of the learning organization. And in it he said, scenarios are stories. They're works of art rather than scientific analysis. The reliability of their content is less important than the types of conversations and decisions that they spark. And I want to leave it there, and I'm going to, uh, I guess, invite... Uh, us to move into the Q&A section of this uh, webcast. And Carla, I believe you're going to come back on the line um, with some yeah. questions for me to respond to. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so this is the moment where folks can use that Ask a Question button. And we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can um, with the time remaining. Um, Susan, we've actually got a couple while you were uh, talking here, but just to start us off, can you say a little bit about how uh, the decision was made to look 20 years out with the ARL scenarios? What's, yes. What's magic about 20 years? <laughs> what's magic? Um, there's nothing magic about it. However, we did have a, a, I think, a pretty long process in trying to decide where to take our time horizon. and. Um, you can, you can build scenarios out as far as you want, frankly. Um, and one thing that we've learned over the years in doing um, scenarios is, in fact, uh, we tend as human beings, because of our challenges of our own mental maps, to have trouble imagining a really different future. And as a result, what we find is, for instance, if we had picked a 10-year time horizon, we probably would have created five-year scenarios. Um, not because we were at fault, it simply would be as far as we could take our imaginations thinking a decade out. Um, and so we played around in our mind with 15, 20, 25 years, and we settled on 20 thinking, you know what, if we really want to look at a different sort of research environment, as the strategic focus suggests, um, this is really a good way to do it. At, at 20 years, we then have a chance to really look a generation out. So you can imagine a whole generation of different types of users coming forward. And so it, it was really that sort of a play in that choice that we made. Great. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, one is that a lot of um, library staff, particularly people who are working directly with the users, um, might find it hard to understand what we're talking about with this outside-in approach. Right. Do you have any thoughts, uh, maybe based on your experiences with other groups, about um, how to help people understand that concept of, of scenarios and doing outside-in thinking? Um, you know, one, it depends on, I don't know where the question is coming from exactly, but I'll make some assumptions. It, it, it probably deals with, you know, so I, I've got a group I'm going to be meeting with, and I want to somehow share this concept with them and get them to get it so that we then can move forward and, and effectively use the toolkit. So if, if that's what, what is meant here, my, my answer would be, you know, one of the things that, that's quite powerful to do is to use the past as a tool um, to understanding the future. And I have very successfully uh, created timelines with groups. And you don't have to go back real far, but um, for the members, what would be interested in is in your own institutions yourself, you know, however old your institution is, set up a timeline up on the wall. And on that timeline, have at the top of it the contextual environment, in the middle of it your transactional space. And I'm saying you could do this at the higher ed level. You don't have to do this at the research library level. It's really up to you. And at the bottom, you could have, you know, your organization, the research library within it. So 
something like that. Or you can even go down to, for people, a personal experience. It could be about them at the bottom of this chart. And you might break it up then by decade. And you'd have people fill in data. You know, what can they remember that happened in the 80s in higher ed um, at this particular time or that? And you'll find people are very adept at starting to fill this chart in. And then you can look back with them, and you'll actually see what we're talking about take place. You'll see something that happened in, the, in a technological advance that was outside higher education that actually influenced that transactional space and then affect it, this particular institution and so forth. So that's a great way to go about it. Um, you can also do it in a brainstorm mode, but this is a little bit more visual for people. Okay. Um, can you say a little bit about who you think will be using the scenarios in the toolkit once they're released? Will they be just for librarians to talk to each other? Um, I, my own thought, and I think our thought on it has been that it's a, it's a toolkit for each research library to use within their organization, and they can even use it more broadly within their institution um, for strategic thinking. So I'm not picturing it's just librarians speaking to each other. I think more powerfully, you want to bring a broad range of stakeholders into the conversation um, that are influenced by this, uh, because that way you're going to really create powerful, um, thoughtful strategy that can be applied. And a big part of this is buy-in. So just like the this discussion we had earlier about mental maps and things, if you have, say, your own little core group of six that uses the tool very successfully and create a new strategy out of it and then go try to explain that maybe to your institution or to a broader audience, you will find it very, very difficult to engage them or get them to buy in. However, if they're engaged in the conversation from the start, that's more powerful. So I'm imagining it would be that broader group that, that you would want to be talking to. Okay. Um, You've uh, introduced a number of uses of scenarios in more corporate kind of business settings. Um, have you, can you say a little bit about what might or might not be really very different about working in a not-for-profit kind of setting? Right. So what we've discovered over time, and it's interesting, most of my work now is in the not-for-profit um, area. And you're right, I gave some examples and things, all that are from for-profit. However, we're finding the application is the same. Um, yeah, you're not looking at making a profit. Your end result isn't that. However, you are looking to achieve a mission, um, to sustain yourself to achieve the mission, which still requires some form of a, a generation of funds that come into the organization and so forth. So everything I showed applies just the same for a nonprofit as a for-profit. And I might invite people if they're interested, um, GBN, G as in George, B as in Boy, N as in Nancy, dot com, that website. If you, if you visit it, um, take a look for a, uh, a um, download called What If, which was actually written specifically for scenario planning for nonprofits, and it's quite helpful and offers some insights. Um, one of you uh, things you mentioned earlier that you try to do with scenarios is use them as a way to push people kind of outside our conventional thinking. And I think your car industry example was, was a good example. You kind of laid it out there. Um, what are some of the things that are going on with the ARL process to try to create scenarios that really do push us um, to think about the future in some ways that are really different? So some of the things that we're, we are, have done and are continuing to do include trying to engage people from outside, if you will, the research library realm and community to help us with our thinking. Because one of the things is classically is the group think issue. Um, so we have been engaging with a group of provocateurs about the future um, to actually think about, well, how is, in fact, um, the world changing? What would be things that could affect um, higher ed or affect research libraries that maybe we haven't thought of before? And we've done a few things. We have actually interviewed a group of these individuals already um, and um, gained information before our workshop we just had, and we actually even invited a couple of them in to help us through that process. And we're in inviting another uh, one of these provocateurs to even join us um, in the coming months as we're creating the toolkit itself. So that's one avenue. The other avenue is we've really tried to spend a lot of time understanding what are what is the conventional wisdom and the current thinking to then say, and how should we challenge it? So we actually had a platform, which was that early internal data gathering that helped us lay that out to understand then from it 
what the big uncertainties are and the unknowns that aren't really being explored within the community. And so we've tried to lay that out and build that in as well. Okay. Another question we've got um, relates to the timeline. Uh, just wondering uh, what more we can say about uh, when uh, this will be released and also what kinds of things will be in that toolkit. I mean, what, what is it that's going to be released? Okay. So we're looking at October, um, I think the membership meeting timing to actually have this released. Um, and in that package, um, it's funny, we talk about the scenarios and the toolkit. I kind of picture it all as one thing. Uh, but what we will have is a set of scenarios which will actually be written narratives. Um, each one will be, there will be a story associated with it. So that um, one of the things that's really important here is that we're not just giving you, um, like my example I showed you, you know, two, bull two bullet points and expecting you to understand what is going on in that scenario. It's actually well written, um, takes you from 2010 out to the future and talks about what that future environment would be like um, for research, for users, and so forth. So the scenarios themselves will be written. Each story will probably be about maybe three pages long because we want the overall document not to be so long that people won't engage with it. Um, there will be an end state table included, which is a description of all of the really key critical uncertainties and how they vary across the scenarios. So it's a great reference tool when you use it, but it also will help you even just in engaging with the scenarios to understand how they diverge from each other. And finally, the toolkit itself is going to offer you information on, um, you know, how to engage with key stakeholders. What we're going to do is try to identify for each of the scenarios what are some of the core strategic issues that are potentially within each story, and then from that, what are then the key strategic questions that your organization should be um, considering, and then give you, um, if you will, some processes, which I'm referring to as templates that you might follow um, to help then create um, your strategy from that material. Okay. Well, we're c coming up on the end of time here, so I'm going to uh, close by saying thank you, Susan, for taking the time to talk with us this afternoon, and thanks to all of you for joining us and sharing your thoughts and questions. I'll note that the webcast is being recorded, and we will be announcing how people can access the archive in the next few days. Um, I believe you'll also um, get an email if you're registered saying um, how you can get access to the archive. Obviously, much more is going to be coming out of the project later this year, and so we hope that you'll be keeping an eye out for future developments. Thank you again, and have a great day.